I want to thank you, Lord, for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for me. Before I ask for anything, I want to thank you, Lord, for everything thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you Jesus for all you've done for me thank for my mountain high thank you for my valley low thank you oh thank you thank you Jesus for all that you've done for Our Lord, our Savior, our Creator, our help, and our strength. We come now to say thank you for healing, for guidance, for direction, and for understanding. Father, we have so much that we have to say thank you for. So we just shout hallelujah unto your name because truly thou art our God. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us a word on today. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us here one more time. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus that you, the Holy Spirit, will control us both now and forever. And Father, there's one name on our hearts today. And I know all are in need of prayer. But Father, you've brought young Kason to see us today. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to see his first worship experience in this place. Father, and we pray that you would give him many more. Keep that hedge of protection around him. Keep showing your mighty actions through his life. Keep showing us that you're still God. Keep showing us, Father, that your hand of mercy will bring joy to the souls of everyone that will believe. And Father, I just pray for the family, the body of Christ. Let us continue to hold on to your promises. Let us still walk in your grace and in your liberties. And Father, let us continue to have this joy that runs from heart to heart and breast to breast. Thank you for your love, your tender mercies, and your kindness. Father, your only true and living God, our Savior. And we offer him to all mankind. Give us strength and wisdom to continue to hold up the bloodstained banner. Now, Father, preach through me and even teach through me. 
Father, I'm just an empty vessel before a full fountain. So, Father, would you bless me till my cup runneth over, that your people might be made nourished, and that they will continue to hold on to your word. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that I pray this prayer. And all God's children say it together. Amen. I don't always try to call names of certain individuals, but that's one name that's been on our hearts and on our prayers for a mighty long time. And as a pastor, you all come across in my prayers. And that's my charge. That's my commission. And I want you all to know that I'm praying for you and that I have a great love and affection for you. And if there be any wicked way in me, would you pray that God would have mercy on me? Because I've been born again, but I'm not complete yet. And I do error and I do make mistakes, but charge it to my head and certainly not my heart. I guess what I'm saying, I'm just emptying up. And I want you to know that I don't, I'm just like Jesus would say, I don't want to hold, withhold any good thing from you. I want the best that God has for you. And I'm doing my best to make sure that I preach his uncompromising gospel. And I'm trying my best to pastor the way that he leads me. But again, I'm just a man. So I pray that you would pray that I learn to lean and trust on the Holy Spirit. And I want to mention our brother Pat back there too. Uh, he has been one that has come and joined this church since I've been here. And I didn't know what great affection he had for me. And I've been knowing him all my life. But it was a testimony that I heard from him when he became a member here that I didn't know. He always held great respect for me, even when I was not a preacher. But he's been traveling. His job has him out of the state a lot of times. And, but he encourages me when he calls or texts and lets me know that this is still his church home. I know that this is God's house, but I'm one of God's children, and it makes me feel good that uh, you can hear the word of God through me and still want to be a part of the body of Christ. So brother Pat, it's good to see you. And, and we're praying for you. And I understand that you may have to leave out soon again. I want you to know that we miss you, but our prayers will still reach our God for you. Amen. Amen. Let me, let me get outside of myself and get to the word of God. We'll be preaching today from the book of Acts chapter four. Acts chapter four. And I told you, anytime you hear, hear any message from the book of Acts, be very careful. You have to be very studious when you read the book of Acts because it's a transition book, meaning that we're going from the law to grace. And you never, uh, as the pastor used to say, you never want to build a house on a bridge. Amen. So you be careful. What you want to do is cross over the bridge Amen. and don't burn it because you may have to come back. Amen. Yeah. And some of us make the mistakes of not utilizing the bridge the way it's, it's supposed to be used by traveling back and forth. <laughs> some of us get so bad that we fall off the bridge. Amen. Amen. So if you know like I know, you better be praying for your preacher. Amen. Amen. But we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 4, and I'm just going to read verses 1 through 4, and I'm going to try to stay in there, but I made a mistake, and I read uh, chapter 4 all the way down to chap up to verse 22, and it, it's a lot on my little old peon brain now, but I'm going to try to stay within verses 1 through 4, but uh, in your own leisure, would you please read 1 through 22, because Either I may end up going past verse 4 or the Holy Spirit will take me past verse 4. But right now I'll just be reading verses 1 through 4. Amen? Amen. And it reads, And as they spoke unto the people, 
the priests and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people, and they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was now even tide. But many of them who heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. And I just want to tell all believers that you ought to preach through persecution. Amen. And I understand the, the word that I use when I said preached. I believe that all of God's children are preachers in the sort or the fact of being proclaimers. Amen. We all have the uh, job of proclaiming our Lord's gospel. Amen. And in proclaiming the word of God, because he has commissioned all of his children to go uh -huh. and tell the gospel story and teach men, women, boys, and girls about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it is all of our commission to proclaim the word of God. Now, I do understand that God has put preachers in certain positions as well. This is not the sermon where I try to put everybody in their rightful position. I'm speaking to the general body of Christ today, that we all are proclaimers of the word of God. And we should all be reminded now that we should preach through persecution. Because we see here in the book of Acts, we see that the disciples now are given the charge to go and tell the story of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have here some, uh, some that are going out, Peter and his brothers, who are going out. And now they're suffering their fir very first persecution. They have gone out into all Israel, uh -huh. and now they are proclaiming the gospel of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And because they are going out and preaching this, what, we, what they consider this new word to this old land, well. or preaching a new religion or a new gospel to a, a different people, now they are being persecuted. Again, they are preaching all over and all throughout Israel. So they're preaching to the Jews, to the Greek, the Gentile, the bond, and the free. They're preaching this message now. It's been given to be preached to all men now. And can you imagine going in and preaching this gospel, which not very many understand or have even heard, and it's being preached in Israel where the law had been taught by the Sadducees and the scribes and the Pharisees. And they had already indoctrinated themselves into their own belief system. And now you have a few men coming in and preaching and teaching something else. Preaching something that is different from what the world called the very elect. Because the, the Bible here lets us know that the Sadducees, the priests, and the captains of the temple got offended by what Paul and uh, what Peter and the, uh, the brothers were teaching in, the, in Israel at this time. So now the struggle is on. And now there is going to be a problem that's going to take place. Because both parties, being under the law and being under the grace, both recognize God. But one had a struggle with Jesus. Amen. Now they have a struggle with this man who had come and lived with him for 33 and a half years. Who had already brought embarrassment to their intelligence. Who had already shown that their system was flawed. And then he only he did it in a matter of three years in his public ministry. But he was a young man when he died. But he had confounded the mind of some old wise men, those that were wise of the world, I would say. So now they're really struggling because he has died and been resurrected. And now he has left some here to continue to tell and preach and teach what he was preaching and teaching before his death. And the Pharisees, scribes, chief priests, and elders really wanted to say that he was still dead. And because Jesus was dead, he had no right to leave anybody here to preach this gospel. After all, he couldn't live up to it. 
as though they believed because they did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They had somewhat of a belief in Jesus Christ because, again, if you read past verse 4, you'll find out that the, uh, they told him, don't preach in that name anymore. And, and they will say, I'll let you go ahead on and preach as long as you don't preach in the name of Jesus. But then they said, well, you want me to preach in the name of, you don't want me to preach in the name of Jesus, but you didn't have a problem when I resurrected one from the dead. See, because a miracle had already taken place, and I, I knew I was going to end up past verse 4. But when you get down in there and read, you'll find out that the, that the brothers told him when we was healing the sick and raising the dead, you didn't have no problem. You didn't care what name it was in. But now when we talk about salvation, then you want to discredit who Jesus is. But I don't owe anything to you. I owe something to you, not from just from the one who died for me, but the one who was resurrected in my name. That's why they said they came in the name and teaching, preaching and teaching in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, let me walk down through here. In verse 2, it says, being grieved they, uh, that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That was very interesting to me because many times when we look at preaching, we always say preaching and teaching is the same thing. But here in the text, it said they were upset with them because they taught and preached. And, and can I tell you something about teaching and preaching? If you look at verses Ephesians uh, just chapter, four, uh, chapter 4, you'll find out that God called preachers and teachers. And he called preachers and teachers for a specific reason. He called preachers and teach, and, and let, me, let me just read it to you. He's in, in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. See, now here's the situation here. He said that the, uh, the brothers were teaching and preaching. And when you're teaching, I always say, well, if you're going to be teaching, you have to be able to teach those that believe. But no, that's really not the case. The Bible says that men, the preachers ought to preach to everybody. That's why they were preaching to Israel, the Jews, the Gentile, the bond, and the free. In order to get a word from the Lord, we often say that you have to be, uh, you have to have the Holy Spirit indwelt in you. But I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit is so intelligent that he will also be able to draw those that are not believers to hear what he says. Because we often say that a sinner can't pray, but I beg to differ. When I was caught up in sin and I did not know who Jesus was, it was my prayer that reached God because God had already touched my heart to let me know that he was real. Same thing with the teaching of the gospel. When you teach the gospel, it will be so that a child can understand and a fool has no need to error. An unbeliever can hear the word of God, but the difference is the Holy Spirit will allow you to accept his word. Amen. 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 So the Holy Spirit is going to show you when he's telling you the truth. He's going to show even the unbeliever and give them warning. But it is the Holy Spirit who has power in him so that he can draw you to the cross of Calvary. So us as believers, we go out and teach the word of God. And we teach it to those that are not believers, and we also teach it to those who are believers. Well, I wrote it down, so let me say it like this, maybe to help you with some clarity. We, talk, we teach the unbelievers for, the, for their conviction and their conversion. The word of God will convict them and convert and convert them. But for the believers, we teach the word of God for their comfort and their establishment. Can you see the difference? We convert them by way of conviction, by telling them the word of God. But those that are believers, they are confident and established in the word of God from the teaching. So that's what these brothers were doing. They were going out and they were teaching the word of God. And it was bringing about conversion and conviction to those that were not saved. Because what upset those that are hierarchy, those that are, were of the Sanhedrin council, what upset them was that they thought they knew it all, they had it all together, and nobody knew God like they knew God. 
but just as a few meek, measly little old brothers that come together in the name of Jesus Christ, just that one sermon, that that one time converted 5,000. So now I got to tell you something. I had to ask myself, what were they preaching? What were they teaching? See, because we still live in a world where the people are not saved. We still are those that go out and try to preach God's word or preach the word of God or preach any another gospel, I would say that. And we can't get 5,000 to come in one day. We can't get five to come in one hour. So I had to ask the question, how do you convert 5,000 in one day? Then what the Spirit of the Lord had said to me is you got to know what you're preaching. Well, let's go back to who they were preaching to. Those that were in charge were the Sanhedrin Council. The Sanhedrin Council was made up from anywhere to 23 to 71 men that were appointed over over the religious matters, the civil matters, and had criminal jurisdiction over all of Israel. So now you have those that are in charge, and we have these men who are preaching the gospel. And... When, and I asked the question, what is it that we should be preaching? Those, those that were preaching our Lord's gospel was preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what the text says. I'm not going any further. I'm exegeting from the text. I have to be careful not to eisegete from the text. The text teaches us that we ought to preach the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here in the text, if we preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a number will be saved that no man can even count. In one day, 5,000 was here. And it also says, preach it and teach it. Well, let me do some more teaching. Don't you remember when the boy had two fish and five loaves of bread? How many did he feed? And how many became whole after their feeding? That's teaching. When the, the word of God is being taught, it's not by your lip service. It's sometimes by your hip service. It's by your actions. you got to spend something to get something in here. And what God is saying, you got to spend some time with people. And when people see your true actions and see what your purpose is in life, then they will be attracted to that. Well, let me flip the coin on you. Those that don't want to be saved, when you go out and you drink with them and you hang with them and you party with them, don't they call you the next day and say, let's do it again? Man, I sure enjoyed myself. We need to kick it sometime. Let me lock your number in the phone. You one one of my kind of guys. It's the same way about teaching and preaching our Lord's gospel. When you preach and teach God's gospel in the midst of the multitude, whether they're saved or unsaved, they will be attracted because the Bible just lets us know that it will bring conviction and conversion to those that are lost. And when they see that it's true in you and you didn't make it up and you're not a, a, a plan, a plan like you're a Christian, but when they find out you really are a Christian, when they are hurting and they give you the their business and they come and counsel and talk to you and they and you sit down and say well this is what I suggest I suggest that we pray unto our God and see how it works people are convicted because you cannot pray to God and not receive an answer and you cannot pray to God and receive a negative answer because God is one who is going to bless you God is one who says I love you enough that I'll meet your needs according to my own will I'm not going to withhold any good thing from you but when people see that you pray for them then they see that you believe in who you believe in and when they see who you believe in really does work then it's got to be something wrong with you to turn away something that you know works and never makes a mistake it's something wrong with a man that turns away from God when he know God is there for him it's something wrong with a man who says I'll give you salvation free of choice it won't cost you anything all you have to do is trust and believe and and I know you can't understand salvation by going to to, uh, getting to heaven, but he is the same God who says, I bless you right here. I give you more than you're able to receive. I w- I'm the one who put breath in your body, walking in your feet, talking in your mouth. I'm the one who clothed you and put you in your right mind. I'm the one who said, I am the bread of life, and I'll give it to all men freely. But now they're preaching this same gospel. 
and it's an offense to the San Sanhedrin Council. So bad that the Sanhedrin Council says that, we put him, that we're going to put him in jail for the rest of the day, evening tide. Well, that really wasn't a big issue with these, and that's why the scripture doesn't speak much about the evening tide. Because if you know what the evening tide is, that means the day was almost over. And the very next day, I, I, I'm going past verse number four, but this is very interesting reading. The very next day, they were turned loose. So really, to be honest, they weren't in jail 12 hours. That's why I say fight through your persecution. Yeah. Keep proclaiming through your persecution. Uh -huh. Because when you preach God's word, the world can't hold you. That's right. Still going to have to turn you loose. Yeah. And if you read all the way to verse 22, you'll find out that not only did they turn them loose, they tried to make a side deal with them. Yeah. They say, well, when we, when we question them, they start telling us stuff like, they start telling us stuff like we're not preaching because you say we can preach. We're preaching because we're commissioned by God. We're preaching because we believe in whom we trust. We're preaching because we know that the word of God is true. And the word of God has given us assurance that no man can do any harm to us. And also to live is Christ and to die is gain. So there's no suffering at the hand of man to anyone who preaches and proclaims the gospel. But I said earlier, in order to get 5,000 and a multitude to be saved, you've got to be careful what you preach. And if you look at what they were preaching, it says the gospel of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, that's what we ought to preach and teach. But I know it's very difficult because we have a, a, an issue in this day and age to where we don't want to preach the gospel. Amen. Or maybe, maybe we think we're preaching the gospel, but we're not. Got to be careful because here's, here's what the danger was with those that were preaching our Lord's gospel of the uh, uh, resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were talking to the multitude, and it's very easy for them to get in combat back and forth with the Sanhedrin Council because they handle not only religious matters, but they also handle civil and uh, criminal. They were over criminal jurisdiction. Yeah. It's very difficult to stand in the pulpit in this day and age and stick with the Lord's gospel because we get caught up with civil situations and criminal jurisdiction. You know it, and I know it too, and, and, and I got to say it, even though it's hurtful to me, we have a whole lot of preaching going on, not only in the pulpit, but in the lives of the believers. We spend more time with civil issues and criminal jurisdiction than we do with the gospel that we have to stay focused on. The Bible teaches us that we preach the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have to be careful not to get caught up in civil issues. Now we're talking about kneeling, bowing, and we're talking about everything else. And I've got to say it because that is what we call popular preaching. But that isn't proclamation preaching. We proclaim the word of God. We have to stick with the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what preaching is all about. And I know what's going on. I know about supremacy. I know about injustices. I'm very well aware of it. I know my history and, and where we've come from and where God has brought us from. But let me tell you something. It's not, it wasn't taken care of by the preaching of the civil problem or criminal issue. It was, it was settled because of Calvary. It was settled because of the preaching of the gospel. Because when we stick with the gospel, it is the gospel that will take care of supremacy. It is the gospel of our Lord and Savior that will take care of injustice. Have you noticed you've done all this marching and you've done all this campaigning and every day it's a new issue? One leaves and another comes about. That's because sometimes we get caught up in preaching the wrong thing. But if we want to get people saved, we, see, we have to also concentrate that we're, we, we don't have to worry about getting people delivered from what they're going through in life because it's going to be something every day. If I concentrate on getting you out of your one little old situation, then I will never get a chance to deal with the rest of the congregation because it's going to be one problem after another. But if I teach you the word of God, you'll be able to handle whatsoever state that you're in. You'll be able to handle what's going on in life. Well, I talked about preaching. Let me teach, tell you about teaching because the teaching is what the doctrine of the Bible if we stick with the doctrine of the Bible, we won't have to go out and try to get unjust laws fixed. 
because you know who the Son has set free is free indeed. You do know that the scripture teaches us that the law is for lawbreakers. So you don't have to worry about the law if you stick with the doctrine of the Bible because it's the one who's going to tell you stop killing, stop lying, stop cheating, stop misrepresent, misrepresenting our God. If you do those things, there's nothing in the world that can hold you down. But we get caught up in voting. We want to turn this place into a polling station. We want to do some voting in here. I know I'm picking on some folks, and it's not just you. We're going live today. You want to turn the church into a polling station. But I just don't believe in voting in the church house if I can't pray in the courthouse. You will not politic. And, and let me say this clear so y'all let them all hear this. You will not politic in this pulpit if I can't preach in, in, in your courthouse. If I can't get up on the judge's table and have a church session, you won't have a, po a political session up in here. And, and I'm just going to say it because I ain't mad at nobody. Don't you know that this is the house of the Lord? Don't you know that God has allowed us to come in at 1030 to maybe 1230 and worship his name? And don't you know that it is an offense to bring any outside interference in God's worship? Don't you know it's offensive to be talking about the ways of the world when we're supposed to be praising God? If you want to get our vote, you should at least say, can I come at a time that you're not having your worship service? Don't come in here in the middle of service hoping that I give you the mic when you get up here. You ought to come in here on Sundays to worship and praise God. You ought to at least respect it enough to say, I'll come in on a Monday or a Tuesday and talk to your body. I'm not against voting. I'm not against praying for those that are in office. But you respect us the way we respect you. I think that's fair. But these brothers kept their composure and they kept teaching the doctrine of scripture and the doctrine of scripture brought 5,000 who didn't know who Christ was in one day then they were persecuted in the same day but the Bible here when you get past verse number four it'll let you know they had to turn them loose the next day and I just told you if you suffer through persecution then the church will still prevail and get larger and larger and, and, and let me say it like this we who are preachers who are proclaimers of God's gospel don't you know we have to go through some persecution and, and go through some pressures and some pains and if you're not going through some pressures and some pain because of you teaching the word of God don't you know the church isn't growing When the preacher is not being persecuted, that means that the world likes you. They don't have anything bad to say about when the world has more good to say about you than the church has. It's a problem. But we go through persecution. So I'm going to take you, I'm going to put the jacket on my back. I know that this sermon is going to be offensive to some of my brothers in the ministry and some of those that have churches on today. But I'm here to tell you, I have to preach the word of God. I have to tell God's children what his doctrine teaches so that they can live a quiet and peaceful life. That's what the scripture says. The scripture says if they hold to my word, they won't have to worry about anything else. So I'm teaching and preaching the best that I possibly can. I've been praying that the Holy Spirit take full control. That's why I'm not hollering and I'm not shouting. I know some say the Holy Spirit will make you shout and make you dance. But if the word of God doesn't make you shout and make you dance, that means you're not living up to the Holy Spirit. This is a rejoicing word. This isn't a word that will tear you down and put your head down. This is one that this is a word that brings life. This is a word that corrects error in our lives. This is the word of God, and it is for all of his children. We ought to eat the word of God. We ought to digest the word of God, and we ought to live the word of God. Against uh, this word, there is no law. There's nothing that can hold us. And, and, and can I just testify for a minute? When I look outside in these congregations here now, I see God's children being blessed. I see them walking right. 
I see them talking right. I see them living a quality of life that the outside world don't understand. But then I also see love in their heart because they're the first one to tell me, Pastor, it's time to go do some evangelism. It's time to go do some missionary work. That's where the real preaching takes place. The real preaching takes the doctrine and the teaching goes on outside of the church. I know we get a foundation in here. But if you really want somebody to see how well your house is constructed, you ought to be able to invite them to come in. And you know how you ought to invite them to come in? You ought to say, there's a man who resides in my house. He has the word of life. He has water that if you drink it, you will never thirst again. He has bread on my table that if you eat from him, you won't hunger anymore. There's a man inside of my house. When I get sick, he heals me. There's a man inside of my house. When I'm confused, he gives me wisdom. There's a man that sits at the head of my table, and his name is Jesus. And at the head of the table, he told me a story. He said, I'm going up on Calvary's hill. And up there, I'm going to die. But don't be afraid. Because on the third day, I'm going to be resurrected. If that doesn't make you want to come to my house, you ought to understand that when he was resurrected, he didn't resurrect himself. But the Bible says that God resurrected him from the dead. If you can't be satisfied with Jesus, you ought to be pleased with God. And in order to be pleased with God, you still got to be satisfied with Jesus. Because he satisfied your debt. Because you had a debt that you couldn't pay. You had a debt for sin that cost you your life. But he satisfied the debt when he died. He said, Jesus, God, I paid it all. Reverend Roden, he was looking at me yesterday. He was looking at me last night here, and God was saying, that boy has been acting up. He's been into some sin. He says, yes, Father, but I paid for it. It's my brother. He's heir to the throne, and Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, but he watched it white as snow. Aren't you glad? That he take red blood and wash a black soul and make it white as snow? When I look at his blood and my black soul, I did a little study when I was in, in, in art class. That's about the only one I made an A in. You take red and mix it with black, and it turns to a, a deep maroon type color. And you know what that was? He was bruised. Anybody ever had a knock or had a scratch or a lump on their bobo? Didn't it turn deep maroon? That's because your blood was contaminated. And when you mesh that black soul up in your blood, it turned maroon, it left a bruise. But Jesus was bruised for our iniquity. And by his stripes, we were healed. I'm just thinking about what he endured for you and I. You know what he did when they stripped him and they hit him on his back. See, we talk about his blood running down from when he was pierced in his side. But if you ever been hit, you know that it'll leave some scars. And when you leave some scars, it was some blood running. See, because the blood started running way before it pierced him in the side. See, because he died before the foundation of the world. See, he had already shed it a little blood for it. And, and, and don't you know it just take one drop? I'm through with it. I'm, I'm through with this now. I'm off the bridge now. Don't you know that it takes one drop for you and for me? And I know it didn't take all of his blood because he's still alive. And, and he paid it all. And don't you know something remarkable about his blood? They didn't have to refrigerate his blood. They didn't have to keep sifting it through the, the, the machine, not this blood. Because this blood that had been contaminated with sin because the Bible said he took on sin. Don't you know it filtered its, itself out? And when it filtered out all the trash, it became red all over again. You know, some of us have to do the dialysis thing, but the God says, it's my heart. 
it's in my heart that I love mankind, that I'll filter his sin through me, and I'll come out white as snow. That's what Jesus did for us with his blood. I didn't mean to go in here and talk about his blood, but I, I feel like that's what got these Pharisees and Sadducees upset because it wasn't God because they had already knew God, Jehovah, Yahweh, and all those, uh, those different names and terminologies. They just didn't know who Jesus was. And it's because they hadn't been introduced to the blood. And that's the same thing that's going on in the world today, and that's what I'm closing with. They don't have a problem with God outside, in, uh, in, uh, outside of the church. They just have a problem with Jesus. But just let them know it was Jesus who washed them. It was Jesus who, partake, who took on all of their sin. And let them know that he's not your enemy. He's your friend. I told you, I can't understand why you get so upset with Jesus. Everybody have a problem with Jesus, but every time I read about him, all he says is, I love you. I care for you. I won't withhold anything from you. I'll give you more than you're able to receive. When the world turns its back on you, I'll face you and give you the desires of your heart. Why do you have such a problem with Jesus? I'm offering him to you. I'm not trying to say that I'm better than you. I'm just in a better situation. And I just don't like being here because he put love in my heart. I don't like being in this situation by myself. So, sinner man, come to Calvary. Come be with my Jesus. I'm telling you, he'll change your outlook about me. He'll change your outlook about God. And he'll change your outlook about him. And he'll even change your outlook about you. Because I know that you can't take care of yourself. I know you're caught up into some trouble that you can't get yourself out of. I know you're hung out on a drug. I know that you're caught up in self. I know that you think you're better than everybody else. But when you sit down at night, you're crying because you got problems in your heart. I know you got a lot, a lot of education and a lot of influence, but it still won't give you joy. I know plenty of you got your bills paid, but you're still wondering what else is left to life because it's just it and doing it for me. Amen. Come to Jesus. Let him fill that spot that's empty in your life. And that, that's what the problem with Satan is. He'll have you think that he has everything for you. And in, is one spot in you that cannot be filled with in its substitute. It has to be filled with salvation. Any man walking around without Jesus is a walking dead man. It's a hole in you that's going to bring about a cancer. That's going to take you out of here. I'm not just talking about earth. I'm it's going to take you and keep you from eternal life. In Christ Jesus. So you can't fill it, sinner man, with something else. You can't fill it with a bottle spirit. It takes the Holy Spirit. You can't fill it with the happiness of this world. It's joy that you're missing. You can't fill it with the wisdom of this world. That's what the Pharisees had a problem with. They thought they knew it all and had it all together. And when they sat down and looked at what they had written, they said, it still isn't enough. Because somebody has found out how to break this one. And we don't have any law against it, so now we got to go back to the drawing table. But aren't you glad that there's only one word, one word of God that never changes, that stands the same every day? It reaches to the highest mountain, down to the lowest valley. It reaches every man, light skin and dark skin, Jew and Gentile. Makes no difference what language you speak. He has an interpreter that's inside of us. That you can understand every word that he says, and it'll breed life and life everlasting. God bless you.